Would you please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel according to Matthew? Our text for today is Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 to 22. Let's give our attention to the reading of God's Word. Matthew 8, verse 18. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Thus far the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to see Jesus Christ in all of his glory as our great Redeemer King who calls us to follow him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in this section of the Gospel of Matthew, which is chapters 8 and 9, which is a very interesting portion of the Gospel of Matthew because of the way it is organized. It is basically a snapshot of the teaching and healing ministry of Jesus. Uh, there are 10 miracles of Jesus recorded in these two chapters. But what's interesting is the way in which Matthew has interspersed these miracles with uh, some discussion and some teaching on the theme of discipleship. So in Matthew 8, verses 1 through 17, we have the first three miracles, the healing of the leper, the uh, healing of the Roman centurion's servant, and the healing of uh, Peter's mother-in-law, who is sick with a fever. But then we come to our text today, verses 18 to 22, that, that deals with this theme of discipleship. Then, after that, Matthew returns back and does three more miracles. In chapter 8, verse 23, Jesus stills the storm, then he heals the two men who were possessed with demons at the end of chapter 8. And then he heals the paralyzed man at the beginning of Matthew 9. Three more miracles. And then what do you find after that? Another discussion of discipleship in uh, Matthew 9, verses 9 through 17. And then once again, he returns back, does four more miracles, and then concludes with the summary of the teaching and healing ministry of Jesus in Matthew 9, verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And so the way in which Matthew has designed this section of his gospel by going with three miracles, then discipleship, three more miracles, discipleship, and then four miracles, He's interspersing the theme of discipleship with the healing ministry of Jesus in order to make a very important point, which is that when Jesus heals the sick, he is symbolically saving them from their sins, and then as a result of that, he is calling them to discipleship. Now, of course, we know that uh, in terms of what actually happened in history when Jesus was going around and healing people. Not everyone whom he healed was literally saved and born again and became his disciple. Uh, for example, we see this in uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, the story of the, the lepers. There was a group of lepers that were all healed, but after they were healed, they just went off on their own, right? And only one returned back to thank the Lord and to become his disciple. But even though historically there may have been many people who were literally healed physically, who were not healed spiritually, nevertheless, the symbolic teaching that Jesus is trying to communicate here is that when he heals a person, he is uh, calling them to himself. He is bringing them into a relationship with himself. Those who are healed, those who are saved, those who have received God's forgiving grace are then called to follow him. We actually see this uh, in a subtle way in the last healing just before our text today uh, that's the healing of peter's mother-in-law 
Uh, it says in uh, Matthew 8, verse 14, when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her. And what does she do at that point? She rose and began to serve him. And so I think there's, I mean, obviously that's literally referring to the fact that she began to minister to the needs of Jesus uh, in a physical way. But I think there's a subtle secondary meaning there as well, which is that those who are healed rise to serve Christ. They rise to serve him as his disciples. And so that is what Jesus is doing here in this section of our text, in verses 18 to 22. He is teaching that those who are called to be his disciples, those who are healed by him, are called to be his disciples, to leave all to follow him. This picks up a theme that was uh, mentioned back in Matthew 4, the first calling of the disciples. Uh, in Matthew 4, verse 18, while Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Discipleship is leaving all to follow Christ. And the basis of discipleship is the salvation that we already have in Christ. We don't become disciples and follow Christ in order to be saved, in order to be healed of our sicknesses and diseases. It's that Christ has healed us first. He has forgiven our sins. He has taken his, our sin and our guilt upon himself. And he has taken it to the cross and healed us and forgiven us. And then he calls us to be his disciples as a consequence of that salvation. By the way, last week I mentioned this idea that when Jesus touched people to heal them, it wasn't that power came from him to the person being healed, but that he was taking on their illnesses. And I based that on Matthew 8, verse 17, where Matthew makes that interpretation. He says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. But as I reflected upon that, I think I might have overstated things a little bit because there are verses in the gospels where it does say that power came out from Jesus and was even transmitted to the person uh, through a physical touch. For example, in Luke chapter 6, verse 19, it says, all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. So I think both are true. Rather than saying it's not that but this, I think both are true, that power does come from Jesus to heal, but there's also this idea of the sins coming from that person to Christ, and then he bears them on the cross. Jesus is healing the sick through his death on the cross. And so we have here a very important theme in Matthew's gospel. And this is the theme of discipleship. The implication of our text, Matthew 8 verses 18 through 22, is that there were more disciples than just the 12. We think of the 12 disciples when we hear that word disciple, and we think of the apostles, we think of Peter, and we think of John, and so on. But the implication of this passage is that there were more disciples than just the 12. Uh, it even mentioned specifically there, verse 21, another of the disciples said to him. Um, we see this uh, throughout the Gospels. There are implications and hints that there were more than just the 12. Uh, remember at the day of uh, Pentecost, that there were many disciples who were gathered there. Uh, it mentions in the book of Acts, uh, that there were 120 disciples in the upper room that had followed Christ. Um, so we know that there were more than just the 12. And so Matthew is using this theme of discipleship to apply it to us as Christians today. He's telling these stories. Matthew is recording these stories of Jesus interacting with people and calling them to be his disciples uh, in order to apply that teaching to all followers of Christ, to all believers, all Christians. In fact, we know that's the case because of the way that Matthew concludes his gospel. Remember at the very end, Matthew 28, when Jesus is talking to the disciples and he's about to ascend into heaven, what does Jesus say? 
He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. And so the Gospel of Matthew is written with this thought in view that there are going to be other disciples who are going to come later on and they too can listen to this Gospel, they can read this Gospel, they can hear it proclaimed, and they can learn more about what it means to be a follower of Christ. Our text is about two particular disciples. Uh, actually, there's one who's a would-be disciple and the other who is what I call a newbie disciple. The would-be disciple and the newbie disciple. The first one is a would-be disciple. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side, and a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. He's a would-be disciple. He's volunteering to sign up, but there's no indication anywhere in the text that Jesus had called him. He's like a young man fresh out of high school who wanders into an army recruiting center and just decides on a whim to enlist in the army. Does he really understand what he's getting himself into? Not really, it's just sort of a spur of the moment impulse. He doesn't understand the commitment involved. That's this would-be disciple. The second disciple in our passage is actually called a disciple, so he really is a disciple, but he is a newbie. He's completely just a beginner. Right? It says there in verse 21, another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. He has just come to Christ, but he hasn't even gotten out of the gate. He has a lot to learn. He needs to learn more about the implications of following Jesus. He needs to learn that there are new priorities for him, that Jesus must be first in his life, even before his family. And so there are four lessons that we can learn from these two disciples, the would-be and the newbie disciple. There are four lessons, two from each. Two lessons from the would-be disciple, two lessons from the newbie disciple. The first lesson is from the case of the would-be disciple. The first lesson that we learn is that discipleship isn't something that you volunteer to do. Discipleship begins with Christ's sovereign call and command. Remember back in Matthew 4, when he called the first disciples, what did he say? Come, follow me. The would-be disciple thinks that he can volunteer on his own without the call of Christ. He thinks that he can just sign up. Perhaps he views it like a hobby. Perhaps he just views it as something he could try out for a time and see how it goes. Perhaps he thinks that Oh, it just seems like a neat thing to do. I see Jesus, this miracle worker. He seems like a pretty impressive person. Maybe I can learn from him. Maybe I can sign up to be his disciple and do what he wants me to do. But he was not called. He was not one to whom Jesus said, come and follow me. And so the first lesson we learn is that Discipleship does not begin with your own decision to follow Christ. Discipleship begins with Christ calling you to be his disciple. And how does he call you? Well, it's what we were just saying before about this basic pattern that those who are healed, those who are forgiven, those who are redeemed, those are the ones who rise to follow Christ. Those are the ones who are called to serve him and to follow him. You know that you've been called if you believe in Jesus, if you have been forgiven of your sins, if you have come to that place of seeing your sinfulness and casting all your hope upon him, if you've come to that place of humbly bowing before Christ to receive his forgiving grace, then you are called. By definition, that means that you are called to be a disciple of Christ. You are called to serve him and to give your life to him. You've been bought with a price and therefore you're not your own but you belong to Christ and are called to serve him. Now, one thing that may come up in your mind is, well, how do I know if I've been called if I was pretty much raised in the church? My parents are Christians, uh, and I've just been in church all my life, and I don't really remember a specific time when I was called or when I was converted and came to know the Lord. If you are a covenant child and you've grown up in the church, you might wonder, has the Lord called me? Did I, did I ever hear that 
come follow me from Christ? And the answer is, you have been called by your baptism. Jesus himself, even in the Gospels, indicates this idea that even the children can come to him and be called. Remember what Jesus said. He said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Apparently there were other disciples who were adults who had followed Christ and they wanted to bring their children to Christ and the disciples said, no, 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 you can't do that. Don't bring your, your, your children to Christ. But Jesus said, no, let them come. Don't hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And so as you grow up, you hear the word of the gospel in church. You hear about Jesus Christ. You hear about the, the forgiveness of sins. You find yourself believing in this gospel and believing in this Jesus. That means that you, too, have the call of Christ placed upon you. You may not be able to pinpoint the exact date when that happened, but you were called by your baptism, and you belong to Christ, and so he calls you to respond to his grace. Now, the second lesson that we learn from the would-be disciple is that following Jesus is more than just simply learning truth from him. It means identifying with Christ in his pattern of life. This would-be disciple is a scribe. It says, uh, a scribe came up to him and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. A scribe is an expert in the law. A scribe is a rabbinical student, someone who's wanting to learn the law and to apply it and to learn from the rabbis who have gone before, to learn the traditions of the rabbis. And so this scribe is looking to Jesus as perhaps a new rabbi that he can follow. He even calls him teacher. And so he's thinking of this relationship of following Christ in purely academic terms, as simply wanting to learn and to hear the teaching of Jesus. But Jesus shocks him by saying, it's not just a matter of being a student and going to school and learning the rabbi's teaching. To be a follower of me means that you have to conform yourself and identify yourself with my pattern of life. Jesus said, to him. Do you realize what you're asking? Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The Son of Man does not have a permanent home. Uh, apparently he was staying at this time with Peter, with Peter's house in the town of Capernaum in Galilee. But it was not a permanent place. It was not a place he could call his own. And he wandered around as an itinerant preacher and healer on the mission of proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and calling people to faith in himself. And so he says to this scribe who wants to, view, who wants to enlist as a student in the rabbinical school of Jesus, he says, do you understand that to be a disciple of mine is far more than just being a student and learning truth? It is being conformed to my pattern of, of life as the son of man. By the way, this is the first occurrence of that title in the Gospel of Matthew. That enigmatic, strange title of Jesus, the Son of Man. What does that mean exactly? Why did Jesus call himself the Son of Man? Well, scholars believe that Jesus is alluding to a passage in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7 which mentions this strange figure who is one like a son of man who is brought before the Ancient of Days and presented before him. And he was given dominion and a glory and a kingdom. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Jesus is saying, by calling himself the son of man, he's saying that he is the fulfillment of that prophecy of this figure of one like the Son of Man who comes to the Ancient of Days to receive all authority and power. By the way, that's also what Jesus is alluding to at the end of the Gospel when he says, all authority and power has been given to me. He's alluding to that verse in Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. 
But the interesting thing is, is that if you read the whole context of Daniel 7, this figure, the Son of Man, is closely connected with the people of God, who are called in Daniel the saints of the Most High. He is identified with the saints, and he is their representative and their head. And the interesting thing is, is that the saints of the Most High in Daniel 7 are described as a suffering people. For example, in Daniel 7, verse 21, it says, As I looked, this horn, and there's, there's this vision of a horn who's representing some kind of political figure who is persecuting God's people. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them for a time. In Daniel 7, 25, it says that this horn shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. But the text also says that the saints of the Most High will receive that kingdom through the Son of Man's victory. Because he will receive the kingdom, they too shall receive the kingdom. And so this figure of the Son of Man has this interesting complexity. He's pictured as this glorious, powerful figure who receives all authority and kingdom and, and dominion on the earth. And yet, he's also a suffering servant. He is also one who, in his identification with the saints of the Most High, is going to endure suffering. And so Jesus likes this title because it contains both elements. You know, if you notice in the Gospels, Jesus does not very often refer to himself as the Messiah. He lets other people say it. For example, he asked the disciples, you know, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. But he doesn't come out directly and say, I am the Messiah very frequently. And the reason for that is because it would have been misunderstood. If he had publicly went out and proclaimed to all of the people of Judea, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah, they would have immediately interpreted that in political terms as if he was coming to deliver them from the Roman oppression and restore them to the land and restore their glorious life in the land as promised by the prophets. But he was not coming to do that. He was not coming f to give them a nationalistic uh, redemption and to give them a political victory in the earthly kingdom of man. He was coming to be the Messiah who suffers. He was coming to take all of the sins of the people upon himself. He was coming to save his people from their sins, to go to the cross and to redeem them. And so the Son of Man is a better title because it's not as easily understood and it can't be just quickly misinterpreted into this political nationalistic idea of an earthly deliverer. And so that's why Jesus so frequently calls himself the Son of Man. And you see it here in our text. He focuses on how the Son of Man is without a home. That he is, uh, he, he even has less of a home than the foxes and the birds. They have homes of a sort. They have, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man is even more despised than they. He has nowhere to lay his head because he is the suffering servant who is coming not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He's coming to be killed and crucified and to be uh, raised from the dead on the third day. And so in the second lesson that we learn, we learn from the would-be disciple, this second lesson, that to be a disciple of Christ is fundamentally about becoming like Christ. It's about being conformed to the same pattern of life of the Son of Man, which is what? What is the pattern of life of the Son of Man? Is it just glory all the way? Glory from beginning to end? No, it's suffering first and then glory. Yes, the glory will come. He will be raised from the dead. He will ascend into heaven. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. That will come in fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel 7. But it only comes through the cross. It only comes through suffering. To be a disciple of Jesus means following him to the cross and only then through the cross to the glory on the other side. Being a disciple of Christ isn't just simply going to school and learning things. It's not just book knowledge. It's not just being a rabbinical student in the rabbinical school of Christ. It is going and conforming yourself to Christ's own pattern of life. 
Now, what are the two lessons we learn from the newbie disciple? The newbie disciple teaches us, first of all, that discipleship is a lifelong process of growth, not a single moment of decision. This second disciple, the newbie, is a genuine disciple. Verse 21, another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. The second disciple was genuinely called, but he needed to learn more about the deeper implications of what it means to be a disciple. This is a very helpful and encouraging lesson for all of us, is that we all need to grow in our understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Discipleship is not simply a one-time deal. You come to Christ, you're a disciple, and then it's all good from there. Discipleship is a series of renewed commitments to Christ. As our relationship to Christ impinges upon our life and upon our relationships and upon our daily lives. And sometimes we don't really understand the implications until we get into the situation, until we have a conflict, until we have a problem, until we have a, a difficulty. And then we learn, oh, this is what it means to be a follower of Christ. And the Lord does not, he doesn't rebuke this, this man and say, oh, you must be a false disciple. If you didn't already know that, if you didn't know at the beginning that you had to follow me first uh, over your family, then you must not have been a true disciple. He's patient with him and teaches him and says, well, here's something new you didn't really understand, unpacking the implications of what it means to be a disciple. Now that you've come to these, this crossroad in your life where your father has died and you're at this situation of trying to decide, what should I do? Now you understand. And so he says, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. And this kind of ties back in with that other point that I was making about those of you that were raised in the church, where you feel like you don't have a specific moment in time where you can nail it down and say, that's when I was converted. You don't have to have that. What you do have to have is when the situation arises, when you're confronted with this mismatch of priorities between following Christ and something else in your life, whether it's your family or some other desire that you have, that you respond to that situation, that you recommit yourself to the Lord. You may stumble and fail. You may make the wrong decision, but the Lord in his grace will bring you back and restore you. And then you learn again. You learn that lesson. You recommit yourself to Christ. Discipleship is a series of renewed commitments to Christ as our relationship to Christ grows and as we learn more about him in our walk with him. That's the way it was for me. I was raised in a Christian family at the age of seven. That's when I prayed to receive Christ. But what did I know at the age of seven about following Christ? And so, you know, I get into high school and there's new things to learn and I start being challenged by my, by my unbelieving teachers. I had a, a teacher who was an atheist who was kind of, you know, feeding me atheist literature and I had to study that and think about that and learn more about the gospel and, you know, read some books on apologetics and. And that was a major stepping point, major point of renewed commitment to Christ in my life. And then life continues. You get married. Things happen, and more and more things occur in your life, and you learn more and more about the implications of what it means to follow Christ, things you had no idea about before. But then you learn, and you don't get discouraged. Yes, you fall, you struggle, you have difficulty, but you get back up, and you renew yourself and your commitment to Christ because you've heard his call. You've known the reality that he has forgiven your sins. You've heard his call in your life. And so you seek to serve him and to live out your discipleship, being conformed more and more to his image. The second thing we learn from the newbie disciple is that following Jesus means leaving earthly relationships for the sake of Christ. The specific situation that he was facing was that his father had died. And according to Jewish custom, it was an absolute duty to bury your parents and your close relatives. The rabbis even taught that if you had a relative who died, and most importantly if it was a parent, if you had a parent who died, that was so important to immediately take care of the burial 
that you could be exempt from reciting the Shema. The Shema is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. That's, the high, that's like the, the core tenet of Judaism. That is the, the Apostles' Creed, if you will, of Judaism. That's the, that's the number one thing you have to do is to recite the Shema. You could be exempt from doing that until you'd finished burying your father or your mother or a close relative. The duty of burial is so important. It takes precedence even over the highest commandment of Judaism. And so Jesus is saying to this man, Jesus is saying that following him takes precedence even over that, even over something that was considered to be the highest and most urgent priority within the Jewish religion. And he says, let the dead bury their own dead. The implication of that is he's saying that those who, those who are not redeemed and saved, they are spiritually dead. Let them take care of their own dead. The implication being that those who are his disciples are spiritually alive. And the reality is, is that those family members that you may have who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, they're not going to understand your commitment to Christ. It just doesn't make sense to them because they're spiritually dead. They're blind. They don't understand it. But the Lord is calling you to follow him even over your earthly relationships, even over your relationships with your brother, your sister, your father, or your mother, to call to follow him for Christ's sake. Our number one priority is Christ and his kingdom. Everything else takes second place. Being a follower of Christ is a total life commitment, and it's a commitment to the very person of Jesus himself. It's not commitment to a creed. It's not commitment to a doctrine. It's not commitment to a... Uh, an ideology. It is commitment to the person of Christ himself. He is the one who is placing that demand upon this disciple here. In effect, almost saying, look, I am your father, right? That the, the earthly father you had, he's part of the dead. He's not, he's not really your father. I am your father. You are to follow me and to live for me. Being a follower of Christ is an all or nothing matter. You give all of your life over to Jesus, or you give none of it. There is no halfway discipleship. But remember, all of this is, it's a heavy claim, it's a heavy call, and, and it, it sounds like a, almost an intolerable burden. But remember that this is all based upon the reality of the healings of Christ being the priority. The healings come first, then the call to discipleship. Jesus is a healer because he is using these healing miracles as an outward sign to communicate the truth of the gospel that he is proclaiming. He is preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all the diseases as an outward visible sign of his salvation. Jesus is the redeemer. He is the savior. He shall be called Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And because he's the Redeemer, because he's the Savior, he calls us to follow him. Jesus is such a worthy Redeemer, King. He gave himself as a ransom for you. He died that you might be forgiven. And so he calls you today to be his disciple. He calls you to grateful obedience to him. He calls you because he's the wonderful Savior who is full of grace and truth. All the blessings of the kingdom of God are wrapped up in Jesus, the king of the kingdom of God. It's just like he, he's like he's a, a, a wandering uh, ball of glory and kingdom life as he walks throughout Judea and he heals that person and cleanses that leper and calls this disciple. All the blessings of the eschatological kingdom of God are wrapped up in the king of the kingdom, in Jesus himself. He is the obedient, suffering servant of the Lord who fully obeyed the Father even to the point of death. It is he who carries our sorrows and sicknesses and sins and gave his life as a ransom, pouring out his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. This Jesus then, calling us to himself, calls us to leave everything to follow him. Let us pray.